you're now uh, leading up the the Boston Dynamics AI Institute, newly formed, which is focused more on designing the robots of the future. And I think one of the things, maybe you can tell me the big vision for what's going on, but uh, one of the things is uh, this idea that hardware still matters with with organic design and so on. Maybe before that, can you zoom out and tell me what the vision is for the AI Institute? You know, I like to talk about intelligence having two parts, an athletic part and a uh, cognitive part. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, Boston Dynamics, in my view, has sort of set the standard for uh, what athletic intelligence can be. And, you know, it has to do with all the things we've been talking about, the, the mechanical design, the, the real-time control, the energetics, and that kind of stuff. But obviously, uh, people have another kind of intelligence, and, and animals have another kind of intelligence. You know, we can make a plan. Uh, our meeting started at, at 9.30. I looked up on Google Maps how long it took to walk over here. It was, you know, 20 minutes. So uh, I decided, okay, I'd leave my house at 9, which is what I did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, simple intelligence, but we use that kind of stuff all the time. It's sort of what we think of as going on in our heads. Um, and I think that's in short supply for robots. Most robots are pretty dumb. And as a result, it takes a lot of skilled people to program them to do everything they do. And it takes a long time. And if robots are going to you know, satisfy our dreams, uh, they need to be smarter. Uh, so the AI Institute is designed to combine that physicality of the athletic side with uh, the cognitive side. So for instance, we're trying to make robots that can watch a human do a task, uh, understand what it's seeing, and then do the task itself. So sort of OJT for ro on the job training for mm -hmm. robots mm -hmm. uh, as a paradigm. Uh, now, you know, that's pretty hard uh, and it's, it's sort of science fiction, but our idea is to work on a longer time frame and, and work on uh, solving those kinds of problems. And I have a whole list of things that are kind of like in that in that vein. Maybe we can just take many of the things you mentioned, just take it as a tangent. Okay. First of all, athletic intelligence is a super cool term. Uh, and that's that really is intelligence. We humans kind of take it for granted that we're so good at walking and moving about the world. And using our hands, you know, hands. the mechanics of interacting with all, you know, these parts, you know, yeah. these two things, yeah. you know. And you've I'm never not, touched I'm, those I'm things not before, looking, right? Never touched, well, I've touched ones like this. <laughs> okay. look, look at all the like things I can it. do, right? I can juggle and I'm rotating yeah. it this way. I can rotate it without looking. Mm -hmm. I could fetch these things out of my pocket and figure out which one was which and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I don't think we have much of a clue how all that works yet. Right. And that's, I really like putting that under the banner of athletic uh, intelligence. What are the big open problems in athletic intelligence? So Boston Dynamics uh, with Spot, with Atlas, just have shown time and time again, like push the limits of what we think is possible with robots. But where do we stand actually? If we kind of zoom out, what are the big open problems on the athletic intelligence side? I mean, one question you could ask, that isn't my question, but you know, are they commercially uh, viable? Mm -hmm. uh, could Will they increase productivity? Yeah. And I think, you know, we're getting very close to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're quite there still. You know, most of the robotics companies, it's it's a uh, it's a struggle. You know, it's really the lack of the cognitive side that probably is the biggest barrier at the moment, even for the physically successful robots. But uh, you know, your questions are good. I mean, you can always do a thing that's uh, more efficient, uh, lighter, more reliable. I'd say reliability. You know, I know that Spot, they've been working very hard uh, on getting the the tail of the reliability curve up, and they've made huge progress. So the robots, you know, there, there's uh, 1,500 of them out there now, uh, many of them being used in uh, practical applications day in and day out uh, where, you know, where they have to work reliably. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's very exciting that they've done that. But it takes a huge effort to get that kind of reliability. Uh, in the robot. There's cost too. You know, you'd like uh -huh. to get the cost down. Uh, spots are still pretty expensive. Uh, and I don't think that they have to be, but it takes, you know, a different kind of activity to do that. Mm -hmm. Now that, uh, you know, I think 
you know that uh, Boston Dynamics is owned primarily by uh, Hyundai now, and I think that the skills of Hyundai in making cars can be brought to bear in uh, uh, making robots that are less expensive and more reliable and those kinds of things. So on the Cogniz side, uh, for the AI Institute, what's what's the trade-off between moonshot projects for you and maybe incremental progress? That's a good question. I think we're we're using the paradigm called stepping stones to moonshots. <laughs> I don't I don't believe and that that was in my original proposal for mm. the institute, stepping stones to moonshots. I think if you go more than a year without seeing a tangible status report of where you are, which is the stepping stone. Uh, and it could be a simplification, right? You don't necessarily have to solve all the problems of your target goal, even though your target goal is going to take several years. Uh, you know, those those stepping stone results give you feedback, uh, give motivation because usually there's some success in there. Uh, and so, you know, that's the mantra uh, we've been working on. And that's pretty much how, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say Boston Dynamics has worked, uh, you know, where the, you make progress uh, uh, and show it as you go. Show it to yourself, if not to the world. What does success look like? Like, what what are the, some of the milestones you're uh, you're chasing? Well, we've we've with Watch Understand Do the project I mentioned before. You know, we've broken that down into uh, getting some progress with what is meaningfully watching something mean. Uh, breaking down uh, an observation of a person doing something into the components. You know, segment segmenting. You know, you watch me do something. I'm going to pick up this thing and put mm -hmm. it down here and stack this on it. Well, it's not obvious if you just look at the raw data uh, uh, what the sequence of acts are. It's it's really a creative, intelligent act for you to to break that down into the pieces and understand them in a way so you could say, okay, what skill do I need to accomplish each of those things? Uh, so we're working on you know the front end of of that kind of a problem where we observe and translate the if it, it may be video, it may be live into uh, a description of what we think is going on and then try and map that into skills to accomplish that. And we've been developing skills as well. So, you know, we have kind of multiple stabs at the pieces of, of doing that. And this is usually video of humans manipulating objects with their hands kind of thing? Mm -hmm. We're starting out with bicycle repair, some simple bicycle repair <laughs> oh, no. tasks. That seems complicated. That seems well, really complicated. It is, but, but there's some parts of it that aren't. like. Uh, putting the seat in, you know, into the, you know, you have a tube that goes inside of another tube sure. and there's a latch, you know, that's, that should be within range. Is it possible to, to observe, to watch a video like this without having an explicit model of what a bicycle looks like? I think it is. And I think that's the kind of thing that people don't recognize. Now, let me translate it to navigation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think the basic paradigm for navigating a space is to get some kind of sensor that tells you where an obstacle is and what's open, build a map, and then go through the space. But if I, if we were doing on-the-job training where I was giving you a task, I wouldn't have to say anything about the room, right? We came in here, mm -hmm. uh, all we did is adjust the chair, mm -hmm. but we didn't say anything about the room, and you know we could navigate it. So I think there's opportunities to build that kind of navigation skill into robots, uh, and we're, you know, we're hoping to be able to do that. So operate successfully under a lot of uncertainty, like yeah, and and lack of specification, lack of specification. I mean, that's what sort of intelligence is, right? Kind of dealing with a situ understanding a situation, even though it wasn't explained. So, how, how big of a role does machine learning uh, play in all of this? Is this more and more learning based? You know, since ChatGPT, which is a year ago, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a huge interest in that and a, and a huge uh, optimism about it. And I think that there's a lot of things that machine learn, that kind of machine learning. Now, of course, there's lots of different kinds of machine learning. I think there's a, you know, a lot of interest and optimism about it. I think the, you know, the facts on the ground are that doing physical things with physical robots is a little bit different than language. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tokens, you know, the tokens sort of don't exist, you know, pixel, Pixel values aren't like words, um, but I think that there's a lot that can be done there. We have uh, uh, 
we have several people working on machine learning approaches. I don't know if you know, but we we opened an office in Zurich uh, recently, mm -hmm. and uh, Marco Hutter, who's one of the real leaders in uh, reinforcement learning for robots, uh, is the the director of that office. He's still half time at uh, ETH, uh, the university there, where he has an unbelievably fantastic lab, and then he's half time uh, leading. Uh, will be leading off efforts in the Zurich office. So we have a healthy uh, learning component, but there's part of me that still says, if you look out in the world at what the most impressive performances are, they're still pretty much, uh, I hate to use the word traditional, but that's what everybody's calling it, traditional controls, like model predictive control. Uh, you know, the thing, the, the Atlas performances that you've seen are mostly model predictive control. They've started to do some learning stuff that's really incredible. I, I don't know if it's all been shown yet, but mm -hmm. you'll see it over over time. Um, and then Marco has done some great stuff and, and others. So especially for the athletic intelligent piece, uh, the traditional approach seems to be the one that still performs the best. I think we're going to find a, ma a mating of the two and we'll have the best of both worlds. And we're working on that at the Institute too.